don't get to use that little bell enough. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Kara Hamley O'Donnell, and I am the city's historic preservation planner, as well as the person who um, helps take care of this building here, the Superior Schoolhouse. Uh, welcome to another edition. Of I think this is. We've done at least a half a dozen of these so far, more than that probably, even maybe approaching 10. We're going to try to do this about every other month, um, and we in fact have a couple booked up for the fall. I want to give you a couple announcements before we uh, bring on our speaker. Uh, the first is that we've, um, in, for those of you who've heard about this through the monthly calendar at City Hall, keep an eye on that to remind yourselves when we get, once we get into the fall about these upcoming lectures. Also, you, those of you who get the mailing from the Historical Society, um, that you'll also be getting a mailing about these upcoming lectures. Uh, for those of you who found this by chance, um, if you're Clevenites residents, keep an eye on your monthly calendar. Um, we will for the most part, always advertise these in the, the monthly calendar. Also, um, if you're a member of the Historical Society, you get a mailing sent directly to you. Um, there are forms in the back of the schoolhouse if you'd like to join uh, the member, become a member of the Historical Society. Um, the upcoming in October, we have um, Drs. Roy Larrick and Craig Semsel, who've done research on the history of the Western Reserve's Euclid contract, which created Euclid Township, which is what a good part of Cleveland Heights is located in. And so they'll talk a little bit about um, the history during the Western Reserve era of this part of the Western Reserve that's part of Cleveland Heights. And they're also um, producing a monograph that's being published by Western Reserve Historical Society on that topic. That's in the middle of October. And then in the beginning of November, uh, Dr. Marion Morton is publishing a book on Cleveland Heights history, and she's going to give us a presentation on a small part of that booklet, which is the history of the Severance Estate, going back into its before it was even born, or be, before it was even owned by the Severance family, and um, onto when it was developed uh, in the 1950s and 60s as a shopping center. So that should be very interesting. We have some interesting uh, slides in that. So that's in November. So we've got a heavy fall lined up. Also, a couple updates on our oral history project where we're interviewing longtime residents of the community. Um, we're moving along very well. Um, we have a brochure coming out to update the community. We're always looking for good people to interview who've got great stories of growing up or, or living in Cleveland Heights. Um, a lot of people think that if they didn't live here for 70 years, they don't count. Um, we love to hear people's stories about um, the 60s um, integration and also back into World War II. You know, we really want to kind of get a broad reach of the community, um, the history of our community. And um, two quick announcements. Uh, the Heritage Home Loan brochures are at the back of, um, well, the front, depending on how you look at it. As you leave the front entrance, there are brochures on the Heritage Home Loan, which is a preservation loan program um, co-sponsored by the city, the county, and the Western, or the Cleveland Restoration Society. It's a 3% interest rate loan for um, home improvements in Cleveland Heights, Shaker Heights, Lakewood. So uh, pick up a brochure at the back if you're interested in doing some home rehab. And lastly, for those of you looking for that, just that right piece of hardware for home rehab, we have is uh, buildings we know are going to go down. We've been raiding them and kind of salvaging some hardware and hinges and doorknobs and that kind of thing. So if you're looking for just the right piece of hardware and you haven't been able to find it, there's a box upstairs that says uh, free hardware. So if you can use it in your home, please do. And um, with that, I'd like to introduce Catherine Cole. Um, Catherine is I'm going to be giving a presentation about Lakeview Cemetery, um, one of my favorite pieces of landscape in, in the Cleveland area, just an unbelievable sight. And Catherine was born in Erie, Pennsylvania, and moved to Cleveland with her husband in 1955. In September of 1995, she retired after 20 years as corporate secretary of the Lakeview Cemetery Association and director of development of the Lakes Lakeview Cemetery Foundation. She is now a consultant to Lakeview, as well as historic cemeteries across the country, in assisting them in setting up and running 501c3 organizations. Catherine attended the University of Toronto in Canada, has an associate's degree from Lakeland College, and attended John Carroll University managing, majoring in business management. She and her husband Richard live in Moreland Hills and have two grown children and six grandchildren. She is active in several professional organizations including Northeast Ohio Intermuseum Council, the Ohio Council of Fundraising Executives, and the Cleveland Convention and Visitors Bureau. 
a longtime mem member of the C American Cemetery Association and the Ohio Association of Cemetery Officials. She is their past president. Catherine was also the first woman to be elected an official at Lakeview. So I'd like to turn this over to Catherine to educate us on Lakeview Cemetery. Thank you very much, and welcome to Lakeview Cemetery. You're going to find it very interesting. I am sure everyone in this room knows where Lakeview Cemetery is, right? Yes, <laughs> no one in the room doesn't know where we are. Uh, we are a very interesting location. We are a very interesting uh, piece of property, if you will. And the name of this presentation tonight is Landscapes, Landmarks, and Legacies. Just that. We are going to talk about the landscapes of Lakeview Cemetery in the four seasons of the year. We are going to talk about the landmarks, the landmarks in people, the landmarks in sculpture, the landmarks in uh, historic people. Uh, we are going to talk about the uh, beautiful buildings, the architecture on the grounds of Lakeview. And we are going to uh, review all of those things and then talk about the legacy. The legacy of Lakeview Cemetery is the legacy to you to come into Lakeview, to appreciate the property, to enjoy coming in and enjoy a walk through this beautiful place. And now we'll start looking at a little bit of the history. Lakeview Cemetery, organized in 1869. This is the sign you see as you enter into the cemetery grounds. We are, our mailing address is 12316 Euclid Avenue. And when we were founded in 1869, there was a prediction made by the Board of Trustees that Lakeview Cemetery would always be in the country. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> the city limits of Cleveland at that point in time came to East 55th Street. So we were indeed in the country. And we were founded as a beautiful landscaped garden country cemetery. This concept started way over in Europe, in uh, England, in France. They decided to take away the little hedges and the fences away from the family lots in the cemetery, make it a rolling landscape, make it a beautiful place to be, to visit. And they did that with the idea that the cemetery would never be the same. It wouldn't be a morbid place. It would be a beautiful place to come into. That concept then came across the pond into the United States. The first one was in Boston, right close to the Harvard Yard, <laughs> and it was uh, founded as Mount Auburn Cemetery, the first one in the United States to have this concept. Then it came westward into Ohio. Lakeview Cemetery was the third cemetery to be called a garden cemetery. Now, a garden cemetery simply means that something grows from the very first little crocus that comes out of the ground until the very last leaf falls off the tree in the fall. There's always something blooming next and next and next. You see all these beautiful plants come to life. And then uh, we come into the cemetery and see the landscapes in the four seasons of the year, beautiful in every season of the year. You come in the Mayfield Gate, we're in Cleveland Heights now. We are, if you come in the Euclid Avenue gate in Cleveland, you go to the left and you're in East Cleveland, and you go up the hill and you're in Cleveland Heights. So we're in two suburbs plus the city of Cleveland there, and there's 285 acres. There is some of the blooming plants in the springtime followed by Daffodil Hill. I hope you have all had a chance to visit Daffodil Hill at the blooming time. It's about the middle of April when they bloom. And on a three-acre hillside, there are over 100,000 daffodil bulbs planted. So if you don't, if you haven't ever happened in at that time of the year, put a note on your calendar for next year to be sure you come in there. There they are, up close and personal. There are the DAFs uh, right by the Garden Crypt buildings. Even though Lakeview Cemetery has been there since 1869, we are still developing, and there are still 70, 70 acres untouched 
and still in natural woodland waiting for future development. That's probably the most su surprising fact, if you weren't aware of it before tonight, that you'll hear tonight, because most people think, because we've been there so long, we are pretty full, no way. Another new development was our first family or uh, community mausoleum. And notice the architecture here. This was an interesting thing. When, you know, our cemetery is run by a board of trustees. It serves on a voluntary basis, always has. It's a not-for-profit cemetery. And when we were building this first community mausoleum, just close to about 10 years ago, they had to make a decision. What kind of architecture do we use? Do we do something classic like the Wade Chapel? Do we do something really Gothic and Romanesque like the Garfield Monument? And the Board of Trustees, I think, in their wisdom, decided that they were going to do something that was very different and very modern and add to the architectural collection on the grounds. We have a good deal of architecture there, and this just adds a new concept to it. So there's a contemporary building now added to the grounds, the inside of which is just beautiful. With This is a skylight up at the top there. So I like to say this is uh, Cleveland's blue skies and white clouds that shine in through that skylight every day. Most every day. <laughs> uh, but I, visit, I uh, welcome you to come in and visit the inside of that because it's a very uplifting, light building. The first shot of color in the spring landscape, that's the Korean azaleas that bloom followed by the weeping cherries. Now this picture was taken from my office window and I often remark that I could never have worked for 20 years at a more beautiful place than Lakeview, watching the changing seasons. And now we'll talk about the first landmark, landmark person. This is Jephthah Wade's little monument, not very little, very tall, but small angel at the top of it. Jephthah Wade is a, a name that most people would recognize in Cleveland, but a lot of people are not aware of what he did to put Cleveland on the map. Um, anybody here in the room know Mr. W Jephthah Wade's business, how he put us on nationally and internationally? Thank you very much. <laughs> I asked a school ch a schoolroom what he was famous for. They knew his name, and they said he started Wade Drugstore. <laughs> but he did. He took a few small telegraph companies, put those telegraph companies together, and came up with Western Union. And it's a name that the kids even recognize today. Every once in a while, you'll see a Western Union uh, commercial on television. Look at his little angel up at the top of his monument. And when you come into Lakeview, just don't look at us as an overall. Zero in on some of these features. We have some of the finest outdoor Victorian sculpture anywhere in northern Ohio. This is a very good example, followed by one like this, followed by another one like that followed by a third. We have everything from these wonderful Victorian sculptures to a geometric cube that sits on its corner. Very interesting. This one even more beautiful with the dogwood behind it. Uh, if you could afford today to put a sculpture like that on your family lot, you might not be able to find someone to do it for you. This is a very important collection of beautiful outdoor sculpture at Lakeview. Dogwood against a small family mausoleum. A beautiful, beautiful tree. Looks like snow, looks like winter time in the spring. Alexander Winton. Did you all know that we were the Detroit of the United States before Detroit was along here with the car business? We did, we had more car manufacturers here in Cleveland, Ohio than Detroit ever had. They just beat us to the assembly line and the fact that you could have a car any color you want as long as it was black. Alexander Winton sold the very first commercially sold automobile in the United States. He was a West Sider. If you go over to Lakewood, you will go to Winton Place. That's where his home was. 
We have Stearns, the Stearns Automobile Manufacturing Building, and was right across the street from Lakeview Cemetery, as a fact. Uh, Mr. Baker, who did the electric automobile, he's the man who put the shift in the middle over to the left side and came up with the steering on the west on the left side of the car. Uh, Mr. Winton, first commercially sold automobile in the United States to a man from Meadville, Pennsylvania for $1,000, not a bad price. He made a trip, that, I was researching him when I first started doing this speech, and I found a newspaper headline. The newspaper paper headline read, Mr. Winton drove his car all the way from Cleveland, Ohio to New York City, and this was a very big deal. It took him 11 days to do it. Of course, subsequent trips were a little shorter, but imagine what he was driving along and taking 11 days to do it. It was fantastic, where the horses had only been to that point. And uh, we also have Mr. White, who took his family's sewing machine company, the White Sewing Machine Company, and started to develop trucks. And his headline, when I researched him, I came across a little advertisement in, in the newspaper, and the advertisement read, White Sewing Machine Company and Trucks. <laughs> As sort of a PS. <laughs> the sewing machine was much more important in those days. So there's our wonderful legacy and, and more. Uh, the Chandler car, the Peerless was the very last car manufactured in Cleveland, Ohio, and it was in 1930, I believe at 31, and uh, that was the last of our automobiles that were manufactured here in Cleveland. Magnolias. There they are, up close and personal. Azaleas with a little bit of Japanese maple in the background. And this happens to be a slide that interests a whole camera club into coming in and photographing in Lakeview. That's a granite monument in the background and a shaft of sunlight coming down and an azalea growing across it. And the uh, camera club became interested in coming in and photographing in Lakeview. And I invited them to come in. They came in, photographed in the four seasons of the year, and we took their photographs, and we framed them, or matted them, and put them on display at the Garfield Monument. They did that for a few years, and then we came up with an idea to ask the schools if the, the uh, senior students wouldn't like to try something like this. So we had them come in in the fall of the year, and take a, a trip through Lakeview Cemetery with a docent, and then come back one more day by themselves, individually go out and take photographs of what they had seen the first day. And we worked with, with Heights kids, we worked with um, the Lutheran School on west side of Cleveland, we worked with a lot of different schools, Brush High School was another one, and they are now still on exhibit up at the Garfield Monument, and the schools come in every year and take photographs and then are exhibited. Tulips with a red bud. Oh, hello. Not only a beautiful crabapple tree, but if you go over that hillside there, you will see Lake Erie, and that is why we're called Lakeview because from the higher rises of the cemetery, you can look clear out into Lake Erie on a clear day, see almost to the, well, part of the lake anyway, not the middle maybe. So that's why we're called Lakeview. There that is up close and personal. Wisteria. There are two of these that are uh, pruned to tree form and they're right inside the Euclid Avenue gates, and this is a car stopper. The cars come in the gates, and if these things are in bloom, they stop. White wisteria with the tulips behind it. And you talk about museum quality sculpture, that is one beautiful piece. It's a bronze life-size angel sitting on a huge granite bench. And we are part of an SOS project going on across the country to save outdoor sculpture. And uh, Cleveland, of course, is one of the places they're following, and the ven one of the venues within Cleveland is Lakeview Cemetery. And this is one of the statues that they're studying to make sure that today's outdoor sculpture 
is on hand for the next and future generations so that they can enjoy them just as much as we have. But this is one beautiful, this is a Hazaret lot. Anyone remember the Hazaret coffee people from years ago? They now do catering. You'll see a Hazaret truck running around Cleveland. Kelly, I laughed at this last St. Patrick's Day when I was doing a speech and I said, hmm, we've got a Kelly green tree there, don't we? But this is another wonderful thing that Lakeview has allowed some people. You know, this is what cemeteries are about. It's the memorialization of your family, of your community, of your nation, as far as Lakeview Cemetery, the legacy of your family there. And Mr. Kelly went out to his, fam his family property out in the country and got a rock and took it to the monument dealer, had the monument dealer put the Kelly name on it and brought it in and sat it on the uh, family lot at Lakeview Cemetery. I don't think you could get much more personal than something like that for memorialization. Followed by this little guy. The family used to come to the cemetery when this little fellow was uh, little, feeding the squirrels. They found this monument at a monument dealer, brought it in, put it on the lot, and that little guy now is about, oh, I suppose he's 55, maybe 58 years old. He's an attorney, and he lives in Cleveland Heights. <laughs> Golden chain, up close. Chinese fringe. When this is in bloom and you go up towards the Mayfield Roadside up in Cleveland Heights area, this grows along the roadside and looks like white lace growing along. Rhododendrons. We probably have every shade of pink and purple going. It's just beautiful to see these and the size of the plants are gorgeous. The, um, Arborists love to come in to see them because our plants are so big. Mr. Marcus Hanna, you all know that name too. He was a very powerful political person for one thing. Uh, if you were running on the Republican Party at the turn of the century, you probably didn't make it unless you were backed by this man. He was very powerful. Uh, he, he really put Cleveland on the map also especially politically. Uh, this is his family mausoleum. And that's a pretty famous little building too. The building was designed by Henry Bacon and he's the same man who designed the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. Followed along by this mausoleum. This is a mausoleum of Samuel Andrews. Samuel Andrews was a candle maker in England who came over to the United States and became the chemist behind the financial wizardry of a man by the name of John D. Rockefeller and the founding of Standard Oil. He's one of the Rockefeller millionaires. We have all of the million, all of the Rockefeller partners at Lakeview Cemetery, including his very first partner when he was in the grain business, Maurice Clark. We have them all there with the exception of Mr. Flagler. He's the man, he was a railroad man and developed the Eastern Coast of the United States, especially down in the Florida area. He's buried in St. Augustine, Florida. And if you go down to Miami, you can go down Flagler Boulevard, which is the main drag in the middle of Miami, and that's Mr. Flagler. But all of the others are here. Now that little mausoleum is also a very important piece of architecture. I've been told by architectural students that that is perfect little Greek temple. Greek temples have to be built to certain proportions, and this meets all the criteria. So there sits on the grounds of Lakeview a perfect little Greek temple. Moses Cleveland tree, still four of them on the grounds of Lakeview. Trees that were there in 1796 when Moses Cleveland came to survey for the city of Cleveland. Those are pretty big trees and beautiful, beautiful specimens. This happens to be one of the white oaks there. The Early Settlers Association put tags on them back when we were celebrating the sesquicentennial in 1971. And now, in the meantime, for the last about 15 years or so, we have had 500 more 
of our trees and shrubs on Lakeview Cemetery grounds tagged with a botanical tag. Now think about it again. Think about where we are. When we were founded, we were a garden cemetery way out in the country. We were a country cemetery. And now look where we are, right in the middle of a bustling area. What a wonderful thing to have an arboretum-type setup in there. We are not an arboretum. We don't do the uh, testing on the trees and so forth, but we do have the tags on the trees set up so that you can come in, and if you see a tree that you think is interesting, perhaps you'll see the tag on that tree and you'll be able to identify it. How nice to be able to bring someone into an arboretum that you can drive through maybe an elderly person or a handicapped person that can't walk through an arboretum can come in there and can see that. Besides, I've told especially the young mothers that live in the Cleveland Heights and surrounding area around here that uh, when their children come home from school in the fall and on Friday afternoon they announce, oh, by the way, I have to have 50 samples of leaves for my class project on Monday, you could come in and you could quickly identify some of the trees in there and pick up a leaf from the ground and you would be well on your way to doing a good deed for your child. Maybe the teacher wouldn't think so, but <laughs> very helpful to some young mothers. <laughs> and you talk about an Ohio champion tree. That's a sergeant's weeping hemlock. And it is enormous. You probably have seen the Sergeant Weeping Hemlock before, but you, I bet you you've never seen the one that big that's well over 100 years old and just an absolutely gorgeous specimen. Charles F. Brush, another one when I went to a school and asked the children, you know what Charles F. Brush is famous for? And they told me he was famous because he had a high school named after him. <laughs> But there is his wonderful monument. That is not a composite on those columns that's standing there. Those are granite columns, and they are just beautiful. Uh, Mr. Brush, of course, was the man who invented the arc light, who lit our public square area of Cleveland, Ohio, first lit public area of a city anywhere in the United States because of Mr. Charles F. Brush. And even down in the Thomas Edison Museum down in Florida, in Naples, Florida, they have a Charles F. Brush exhibit. I was very pleased to see that when I went in, did some further research on that, and I found a fact that we might be able to brag about in Cleveland, that when Mr. Thomas Edison developed his incandescent light bulb, he had to borrow a patent from our Charles F. Brush. So now we may go home and brag about that. That's a ginkgo tree, a very interesting tree. That is all one tree, by the way. It goes all the way over to the left, all the way over to the right, and straight up through the middle, and happens to stand right next to the Garfield Monument. Is anybody familiar with the fruit that drops from that tree in the fall? Yes, <laughs> somebody's making a face up here. The tree has a fruit that falls off in the, win in the fall of the year and it's terrible, terrible smell to it, just awful. But it's, a, it's a, a herbal tree. It's uh, reputed to be the oldest living fossil in the world and it's an oriental tree. And those ginkgo seeds are used for your ginkgo biloba and your, uh, the things that you go to the health food store and buy. And because it was one fall when the nuts were down on the ground and our men hadn't been around to, to rake them up yet, there was a school group that came in and they walked up that little pathway there. And the kids from the school bus saw all the nuts on the ground and picked them up and they thought, oh, aren't these cool? These are real smelly. And they picked them up and they stuffed their pockets with them. <laughs> And we had one very unhappy school bus driver that day. <laughs> Pagoda trees, another interesting tree. There's two of them out by the Mayfield Road entrance in Cleveland Heights again. And those trees bloom. They think it's springtime in the middle of August. In fact, you'll be coming up to the blooming time if you're in in the next couple of weeks or so. You'll see these two trees have a little springtime blossom the first part of August. And of course, our Ohio buckeye, 
horse chestnut. Uh, most of the trees that you see today and you think that they're Ohio buckeyes or not, they're horse chestnuts. Uh, uh, buckeye is an endangered species. We are trying. We still have about three or four of them on Lakeview Cemetery grounds, maybe more now, and because we're trying to propagate them so that we keep the Ohio buckeye alive and well and living in Ohio. The little dissectum leaf maples are just beautiful, a whole big collection of them. They look like that if you get close up to the leaves. They look like feathers as they blow in the breezes in the summertime. They're beautiful. And this, of course, is the Garfield Monument, but my reason for having the, the slide in here is because that's a very, very steep hillside there. And the Garden Cup of Cleveland um, helped us out by putting a garden on that hillside that was drought resistant because the water just ran right down the hillside. We couldn't grow anything on it. So they decided that they would put this garden in for us, and they did. They planted all the wonderful grasses and things that would grow well on a well-drained soil, and it was followed along by two of the wettest summers in Cleveland's history. <laughs> so we have one of the best-looking drought-resistant gardens anywhere. So if you want to know what to put in your garden and you need something on a, a steep hillside or, or in a rock garden, come and look and see what we have. Anybody here remember hearing about the Collinwood School fire? Yeah, it happened in 1908. On an Ash Wednesday, before the day was over, there were 172 students and two teachers who had lost their lives in this fire. And this was a terrible tragedy in the city of Cleveland. And this monument to, to the children and teachers from that fire happens to be the very first stop on our tour as you go through Lakeview. The, the school buses especially will stop at the office, pick up a docent, and go through. And we have to explain to the children about this and what happened. And this is how we explain it to the children. They're relating to it. They're, these are students who are in a school when this happened. Um, this, the rumor that started after the fire was that the doors of the school opened inward and they could not all get out. So before the fire was extinguished and before the day was over, there were 172 students who had lost their lives and two teachers. But because the rumor persisted, building codes were changed. Rules were changed starting in Cleveland, then Ohio, and then nationally. Any public building has to have um, doors that open outward. And they have to be equipped with a panic bar of some kind so that you can exit there and you don't have to fool with the doorknob. So we tell the children maybe because of this awful thing that happened in Cleveland that hundreds of thousands of lives were saved because of uh, the building codes that were changed here. So this is how we handle this with the children. Also, the school started using more fire drills to teach the children how to exit the building safely. Uh, the children in this classroom may have gone through something like that. Uh, they had, uh, in every school then, I had a teacher come back to me one time and say, you know, it's interesting. Uh, the kids in my classroom, the next time we were out for a fire drill out on the schoolyards, my children were telling the class next to them the reason why they were doing this, because of what happened here in Cleveland. So the kids are listening. All the children, of course, are not buried at Lakeview Cemetery, but on the other side of that monument, all of their names are inscribed. This is... Uh, fall of the year now. We're through spring and summer and we're into fall in the beautiful colors. One of three of the private homes that are still on the cemetery grounds where our people live. I, I really think this is one of the reasons why, knock on wood, we have not a lot of vandalism at all in Lakeview Cemetery is because of these houses. They act as a little security system all by themselves. Our families live in those, so they are there uh, traveling around the cemetery, maybe coming in and out in odd hours of the day and night. Uh, another fall season. This is, scene, rather. This is probably the second most beautiful time of the year, and it's very difficult. It was always hard for me to come in with my camera in the back seat of my car into the cemetery and go straight to the office in the fall and the spring. <laughs> 
It was very difficult. I had to turn my head and say, you must go. There's one scene after another course. In the fall, the colors are red, and you can't see this too much, but this is lovely red bush over here, probably euonymus. That is mountain ash in the fall. There is a dogwood in the fall, almost as pretty as in the spring. Looking from the Garfield Monument down into the cemetery, if you look all the way over to the right, you can see the Euclid Gold Coast, and you look all the way over to the left, and you can see the Lakewood Gold Coast. Quite a vista. That's part of the garden cemetery concept also, is the fact that you must have vistas within your cemetery, and we have got them in spades. It's really beautiful. And some of the biggest names in Cleveland's history have some of the smallest memorialization. You really have to go look for them. This happens to be the grave of Mr. Newton D. Baker, 36th mayor of the city of Cleveland, secretary of war in the Wilson cabinet. We have George Humphrey, who was secretary of the treasury in the Eisenhower cabinet, 22 mayors of the city of Cleveland, including the first black mayor of a major city. Sports people, Ray Chapman, anybody recognize that name? Cleveland Indian. 1920, he became the first major league fatality on the baseball field. He was hit by a beanball thrown by a New York Yankee, Carl Mays. <laughs> Maybe that's where all that started. Uh, Coburn Haskell, how many of you are golfers in this room? Did you know you can thank a Clevelander for being able to hit your golf ball a country mile? He developed the modern interior of the golf ball. How about Mr. Garrett Morgan? He was driving down a street here in Cleveland and saw an accident, decided we needed a tricolor traffic light so that we could regulate the traffic, and now, of course, the tricolor traffic light is used nationally. He also developed a prototype of what we use now as a gas mask. Adela Prentice Hughes, the woman who brought beautiful, beautiful music to Cleveland brought the Cleveland Orchestra, Nikolai Sokoloff here to start the, the first conductor of the Cleveland Orchestra. They uh, performed their music down, first of all, at the old armory downtown, and, and of course then in the Masonic Auditorium. And she started the Fort Knightley group, the Cleveland Children's Concerts. Uh, she just was a wonderful, she was a talented, very talented pianist herself. She could have played in concert herself and a graduate in music, but she brought beautiful music to Cleveland. Speaking of music, last St. Patrick's Day, when you were all singing, when Irish eyes are smiling, and Mother McCree, written by an Irishman over in Ireland? No way, written by a Clevelander. His name was Ernest R. Ball. So there's a little bit of trivia for you. Lots of interesting things, including the first woman to own a major league baseball club in the, in the country. She owned the St. Louis Cardinals from 1911 to 1918. Helene Britton Bigsby was her name. So take those little facts home and, and wow your neighbors with them. <laughs> Elliot Ness. Another name that you would recognize, the Untouchables in Chicago, of course, and uh, Al Capone and so forth, after he was finished with getting rid of all of the uh, bad guys up there, he came here and he happened to be our safety director, and here he is here, safety director of Cleveland from 1935 to 1942. And he came to Cleveland when we were rated the worst in the country for safety in our public systems, in the, in the uh, fire department and the police department. And within a couple of years, he had us right up at the top and uh, cleaned us all up here too. Uh, not from crime, but for safety here in Cleveland. Our little uh, buildings on the grounds that were built from stone that came from our stone quarry. There's the stone quarry. You have to get out of your car and walk back, but it's a beautiful little place up in the Mayfield Road area again. You know, the, the top part of the cemetery is all rock. 
you come down the hill in front of the Garfield Monument and you're down into sandy soil. That were eons ago, there was a glacier that came up and that's why we're sandy at the bottom there. And you come up to the top of that and that is the first rise of the Appalachian Plateau as it begins to form here in Cleveland and goes eastward uh, into Pennsylvania and New York State. So there, the rise of that Garfield Monument is where the stone starts. And this is the um, Berea Bluestone that is quarried, was quarried at Lakeview Cemetery for years to build those buildings. Um, this, of course, is a, a scene from uh, the men who were quarrying the stone. Now, unfortunately, nobody thought to turn that picture over and put a date on it. So we're guessing that it's probably around 1905 something, around in through there, where they were quarrying. Uh, I'll tell you this much, it's before the days of OSHA. <laughs> there, there's not a hard hat in that bunch. Well, maybe this derby over here would qualify as a hard hat. But uh, not only that, but that man in that wheelbarrow is going to wheel that wheelbarrow down that plank. That would never happen today in a million years. Uh, you know that the association between Little Italy and our men who were quarrying stone and building the wonderful monuments was there. Little Italy is there because Lakeview Cemetery is where it is. They came over from Italy and settled there and they formed our men that worked in stone at the cemetery, including doing this wonderful wall that goes down the hill into Little Italy. That stone was built from stone from our stone quarry and built by our men. We did have an engineer that designed it, but our men built it. That might be another little piece of trivia you didn't know before tonight. Euonymus, Wade Chapel, said to be the finest small building in Cleveland, and I honestly believe it is. Designed by Habel and Bennis, the architects that did the West Side Market, the art museum. You walk into the building through four-ton bronze doors into an interior that is entirely designed in the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Studios in New York City. The whole interior is a Tiffany design. The window is a febrile uh, method that he used. Small window, but this is the only place I can find in the country where you can say that the whole interior is a Tiffany design. I have researched it through the, the Tiffany Museum in Florida and every place else that I've asked questions of everyone. If, if anyone knows of another building that can call itself entirely designed in the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Studios and I've not found one yet. The chandeliers are alabaster, cut from one piece of alabaster, inlaid with gold and glass mosaic tile, as are the railings, the benches up at the front. The uh, walls are all gold and glass mosaic tile. This is a close-up of the window, including that kind of a close-up. It's very difficult to take pictures in there, and that these pictures do it no justice. They really don't. You have to go there to see it in person. The walls are 32 feet long, 9 feet high. They depict rowing through the river of life. These are the prophets of the Old Testament on one wall. They're the champions of the Christendom on the other wall. So it's an Old Testament, New Testament walls. Um, that is not a tapestry or a painting. That is gold and glass mosaic tile set in there piece by piece. If you look at the arms on the oarsman as they're pulling back, look at the dimension he gets by using pieces of glass. And he gets the muscles on their arms popping as they're pulling the oars back and look at the construction of them. Well, there's another question by one of the children. Mrs. Cole, how many pieces of tile in this room? <laughs> My answer was thousands. <laughs> the tiny, tiny little pieces around his head. You're looking now at the New Testament wall. That's why he looks different than the, than the prophets of the Old Testament. Look Old Testament. They, these men look more New Testament. Uh, each one has its own personality. Each person in the procession carries something to depict something from the Old Testament or something from the New Testament. That is a gorgeous building. 
and such a treasure to people of Cleveland. If you have anyone visiting you from out of town that's at all interested in art, please take them there because it is well worth the trip over. Winter, another beautiful season of the year. Van Swearingen's, those wonderful men who were railroad men also, who developed Shaker Square, who designed Shaker Heights, who lived out in Hunting Valley and beautiful Daisy Hill Farm. They were uh, brothers who worked together all of their lives. N neither of them married, so they worked together all of their lives. For Cleveland, for us, they uh, did fantastic things before their time here. Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller, who started his standard oil business right here in Cleveland, first started in the grain business. And that monument is quite the monument also. That is 71 feet tall, and it is one piece of granite. Not built in sections, but one piece of granite standing on a square donut on the bottom. The largest piece of granite ever quarried from Barry, Vermont, and still holds that record for memorialization purposes. The largest. They had quite a time getting it out of Vermont. They had to build a railroad spur up there, then they brought it down to our railroad across the street from Lakeview Cemetery and brought it in across Euclid Avenue and then had to bring it up to the top of the steepest hill in Lakeview. This is a very, very steep hill. If you're there the next time, you stand by there and look down that hill and you can see what a problem they had getting one solid 71 piece, 71 foot piece of granite up that hill. Um, they did it by means of putting the monument on wagons and hitching up a team of horses, bringing the horses, the, the wagon up a little bit, wedging the wheels of the wagon, change the team of horses, bring it up a little bit more, wedge the wheels of the wagon, change the team of horses, bring it up a little more, and that's how they got it up to the top of the steepest hill in Lakeview. Quite an interesting uh, occupation that day for those people trying to get that up that hill. There is the name on the bottom of it. And uh, you know, did you notice that there's a little ledge on that monument? I'll go back up and show it to you again the little ledge, the, the bottom donut. When we go up there, you know the, the story of Rockefeller and his dimes. He used to carry dimes in his pocket to uh, give a treat to people who helped him or somebody who uh, maybe hitched up his horses or whatever. And uh, every once in a while, we'll find dimes sitting on the bottom of that monument. <laughs> people who want to come away with a little bit of Rockefeller money. <laughs> I tried it and it doesn't work. <laughs> This is what, when I take these slides out of town, I tell them that this is what every day looks like in winter in Cleveland. <laughs> this is the front porch of the house that stood on Public Square, right where BP America building stands today. The family took the front porch off and brought it to Lakeview Cemetery, and that's the memorialization on their family lot. And their name is Lemon. This is a Samuel Andrews mausoleum in the winter. There's the Mayfield Gate in the winter. There's the Garfield Monument as seen through the uh, middle of another monument on the grounds. Monument to the 20th President of the United States man who wasn't president for a very long time, and people ask why such a big monument. That's probably the first thing they ask. Because this man represented us for 19 years in the House of Congress. He was a very, very well-known man in this area. Very intelligent man. Had he been given the chance, he probably would have made one of the most intelligent presidents of the United States. But he wasn't. And the, the uh, the uh, United States had just survived the assassination of Lincoln when along came, in 1881, the assassination of another president of the United States, and the whole entire country was thrown into mourning. They were, uh, this is why 
$225,000 that it took to build that monument was sent in, a lot of it by the nickels and dimes of Ohio children sent in to build that. So it was $225,000 it took to build that monument. Why aren't we going to clean it? Because we renovated it and we didn't clean it. Two very good reasons. Number one is that it's on the National Register of Historic Places. You can't touch the uh, outside of the building uh, or take any surface off of it. Uh, plus the fact that it's Ohio sandstone. And if you would take the, the uh, outside off of it, if you would sand it down to where it was in a lighter color, you would probably have it blackened twice as fast and twice as dark. So we are not going to touch it. So we are going to change our lingo then, and we are not going to call it a dark monument. We are going to call that patina. So the patina is actually helping that building survive. Going down through the cemetery in the ravine area, if you look up there to about two-thirds of the way up the picture, running across there, that gray line is this, the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District Lakeview Cemetery Dam. It is 500 feet across, 60 feet above grade, 40 feet below grade, and holds back the mighty Dugway Brook. <laughs> It, uh, if you were in there on a day, well, in a day like today, you might see some action behind that dam. But if you were in there uh, last uh, two days ago, when it was sunny and it was very dry, you would see nothing but a puddle behind that dam and wonder why it was there. Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District built it. It's your tax dollar, so come and visit it. Uh, because the Heights area built so many shopping centers and so forth and put in so much concrete. The water didn't, couldn't go in the ground anymore. <clears throat> so the water burst out at the top of Lakeview Cemetery and would come out onto Euclid Avenue. Do you remember when the buses used to have, people used to have to get actually up on top of buses to get out of the water? This was back in the, about the 50s. Uh, well, this is what happened here. They decided that they were going to put the dam in there. When it was constructed and dedicated in 1976, it was the largest concrete-filled dam east of the Mississippi River, standing right here in Cleveland. There's the Garfield Monument up there, so you can see where it is. So go and visit it. One of these days, we're going to have a bus, school bus that's going to go right over on its side because every kid is hanging out the window to look at this. It's wonderful. You can see this is before dedication, so that's why people are walking across it. You can't do that anymore. You can't walk across it. And I left this in here, too, because it shows the trucks down there. It gives you some idea of the size. That is a big dam. There's the working side of it. I have actually seen it on a good, good rainy day. I've seen it up the water, up to where that line runs across the middle of the dam there. I mean, really looking like the, the a small size Colorado River. It's amazing to see it. The water goes, the sluice gates operate by computer from Strongsville. <laughs> they know when it's raining here. And they close it, the water backs up behind the dam, then they open, it goes down and um, over the, the spillway on the upper lake, down underneath the lower lake, and eventually out into Lake Erie in uh, Bratnall. Somebody told me these were people looking for water behind the dam. <laughs> of course, they're bird watchers. Mothers who bring their children in for picnics by the side of the lake with the ducks and the geese. Mother Canada Goose, who builds her nest every year in one of our big flower urns, so we have to wait till we can plant our geraniums after she has her babies, and there they are floating away in the lake. That's a rabbit in the center. The last few years, uh, occasionally, we'll have a deer in there. Yeah, kind of urban for a deer. Um, every tree has its own resident squirrel. There is one good shot of the downtown skyline. That is taken from the Garfield Monument. That's the vista that you get. 
I won't tell you how long it took me to find a day to take that picture, <laughs> but there it is, and here is a closer one of it. You can even see Jacob's Field over there, where our Indians will once again, one of these days, win a good ball game. <laughs> And uh, I think, just by looking at this and thinking about what we have here in Cleveland and what our downtown skyline looks like now, I think if we went back and we asked these people in 1869 if they thought this was a really good vista from their garden cemetery, I think they would have agree that it is. That's a pretty nice looking skyline. And of course, that's all University Circle down in the foreground there too. So um, I, with that, I would like to uh, ask you if you found out some interesting things and found out some new things about the city of Cleveland and how you liked your trip through Lakeview Cemetery. I can't see. Let's see. Where are you? Okay, go ahead. Catherine, you had said that Lakeview was founded in uh, 1869. Right. Is it, are there graves there from from that time or not really 1870 was the first one <laughs> oh, I see. but yes. where would where would you find that section the one section one mm -hmm. if you look on your map you all have maps in here the very first burial was uh, in 1870 and it would be right where oh where the the uh, number 25 is that is the area, that's section one. And that is where the first burials are of, uh, and then of course, after that it was section two and so forth and went on. And now there's burials all through the cemetery. There's 60 some sections now. And room, as I said before, 70 acres untouched, 70 acres ready to be developed at some future time. So with good development, it'll be quite a few years more. Oh, yes. The grounds of Lakeview are so magnificent. How many people does it take to maintain uh, the plantings and the, the grounds? The plantings? In the going season of the year, there's probably uh, there's three divisions. Construction division is all year round, and they work, but they're mainly, mainly in working the big machinery. The gardening sections are probably about oh, six to 10 people in each section in those months. In the winter months, there's not very much. And then in administrative staff and so forth, there's about 20 people in that included as administrative staff. So there's, there's quite a big staff there, especially in the summer months of the year. It's, uh, you want to know what the biggest boon to the cemetery in industry has been in the last maybe 35 years? The weed eater. Yeah, you don't have to go this way around the headstones anymore. You use the weed eater. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> A little trade secret. <laughs> okay, any other? Don't forget that this, in your book, in your pamphlet here, it tells when the buildings are open. And the Wade Chapel never used to be open. Now it's open to the community every day from the 1st of April until about the end of September. The Garfield Monument is open until November, but the Wade Chapel is a little hard to heat. And as soon as you open up the doors, you've got all of the cold air coming in, so it's a little harder to heat that building, so it's not kept open. But of course, if you wanted to go in to see it, and there was no uh, funeral services or anything going on, you could ask at the office and they would do their best to try to find somebody to go over there with you if you had, especially if you had people in from out of town that would want to see it. How many in this room have never been in Wade Chapel? Oh my, well, we'll have to do something about that. <laughs> maybe, maybe organize a tour from, from your, uh, 
from this place and go over to see it because it's well worth your trip over there to see it. It's just a magnificent. And anyone who has seen it will tell you that my, my slides do it no justice because you cannot take pictures in this. Very, very difficult. It's, yes. Oh, about the new art that is displayed throughout the grounds. This is a new art display that was supposed to be leaving this spring, but now that I've heard lately that they are keeping it going until the fall. And it's very, very interesting, and all kinds of comments have come back to me as I go through the communities. I do, last year I did about 65 of these speeches, so I go all the way down to Medina and out to Lorraine and Youngstown and so forth with this. And they're all asking me about this because it's so unusual. And it really is a beautiful, Beautiful. If you stop, and I didn't bring one up here with me, but in the office there's a book that you can get that explains what you're looking at so that you can further understand the explanation of what the uh, artist had in their mind when they were designing these sculptures. They're all different, they're all very different, and some of them are easily understood by looking at them, some of them are not so easily understood as you look at them. Have you seen them? <laughs> well, they can now. In the future, they will bring more in and different ones in because these, of course, at the end of the exhibition will be sold. So, uh, yes, and I believe, I just heard the other day, I haven't confirmed this with the office, but I just heard the other day that several of them have been spoken for, so. I, I'm that, you know, I'm not sure about that, but uh, this is what I had heard. So do go over and see them. It's very different, and it's um, caused a lot of conversation in the, uh, especially in the garden cemeteries and the bigger cemeteries that would have room to do something like this because it's a very, very interesting concept to have this outdoor sculpture shared with contemporary artists in, in a contemporary world uh, alongside the beautiful Victorian. It's interesting. And it's interesting to see how similar some of them are to the um, Victorian sculpture, just maybe dressed a little differently. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Okay. Was Lakeview always an open cemetery? Yes, ma'am. All races, religion, colors, and creeds have always been buried there uh, ever since the very beginning. It is an open cemetery, not-for-profit, run by a board of trustees that serve on a voluntary basis, always have, and um, with very good judgment, on my, in my opinion, a very good judgment on the parts of our board of trustees, always as far as my experience goes. Uh, my father-in-law was one of the Italians that took care of the gardening for about 20 years Very good. before he retired. He used to have his own garden in there. Yes. And uh, I remember 30 years ago, when I first came to Cleveland, we were able to ride our bicycles through there. Yes. He was one of the uh, ones that wore the hat on Memorial Day and when all the people were coming in. Sure. What and was his last name? Terrazino. Okay. Giuseppe. Okay. And um, I was all, I often wondered why, you know, because Lakeview <laughs> is so beautiful, why you couldn't sell a permit for bicyclists? You know, you can't open it up to everybody, but if you sold a permit to the bicyclist and the only way they can get in there is on, on a bicycle, you know who that person is, you know how to track them down if there's any problem. It's just so pretty in the spring yes. Yes. And, and you can't go through and see everything unless you're Well, I'll tell you the reason why there are no bicycles allowed in there and that is because we did have bicycles in there at one time and somebody had an accident and sued the cemetery. So that's what happened then, and they said, no more. So you have to leave it up to them. Something to be thought about, maybe. <laughs> yes. That, that could go in, if you charge something like a fee of $25 a year or whatever, whatever it is, that fee would go into maintaining something mm -hmm. or buying something mm -hmm. to right. improve the cemetery. Right. And then we, especially for me in Cleveland Heights, it would be a great. Yes place to go bike in yes. the spring and see all the beautiful flowers. Yes, 
I agree with you too. I had always wanted to write in there, but never, ever attempted it because of that, sure, right. And you know, the, talking about the money coming in too is, is the fact that Lakeview has a foundation there too where uh, any of the um, money that goes in not into the cemetery itself goes into the foundation and pays for the educational programming and so forth in the, in the cemetery. We were the third cemetery in the United States to have this concept. There's two, two uh, corporations there. One is the association and the other is the foundation. And it's a very, very interesting concept. That's what I do when I go out to other cemeteries. I've been out to a couple in California and, and so forth that um, are interested in perhaps doing a corporate era, doing a foundation. Really a, a wonderful concept. Yes? Is that it? Well, I hope you have all enjoyed your time here tonight. I've enjoyed talking with you. You are a wonderful audience. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you for asking me. Thank you for all coming out. I see a lot of new faces. I'm used to having, seeing a lot of the same faces at these presentations. For those of you who haven't been through the schoolhouse, you're welcome to go upstairs and uh, check out the second floor there. And uh, come back again. We're open here Tuesdays from 1 to 4 and the first Saturday of each month from um, 9 till noon. So stop by and see me.